Welcome one and all. You've exited the podcast hyperspace and entered orbit around our little rock in space. That's right, you've entered the garage. I'm your host, Dan Massimino. I'm the MC of our little group of space cadets here in the virtual studio. Just want to take a quick minute to thank our many listeners out there in the podcast universe. Your support means so much to us, and we love all the notes, feedback, and engagement that we get. So friends, thank you for tuning in once again, giving us your ears for a bit while we try to make the retail media industry a better place for us all. If you do happen to be joining us for the first time, welcome in. Grab your tool belt and slide up to the workbench and let me fill you in on what it is we say we do here. The Garage is a place where we get together and talk about many things, but where we really hit that sweet spot is when we get some friends and dive into the why, the how, and the who the heck cares about retail media innovation. Speaking of space cadets, my co-host is a fine example of the right stuff. In fact, given the opportunity and a single roll of duct tape, my man could have fixed that broken space capsule and come home with its entire crew without issue. And in fact, he would have thrown in an oil change and cleaned the windshield free of charge. He is the ground control to my major Tom, the vice president of product innovation at Albertsons Media Collective, Evan Havorka. Hailing frequencies open, Evan. Can you hear me? Coming in loud and clear, Dan. Thanks again for another world-class intro. I think the listeners would be surprised to learn that You've never really had to redo those. I don't know if that's just like you go into the zone and man, you're like a machine. I love it. One time, the very first episode, they said, all right, I had to do it twice. And it was take a deep breath and go. And I haven't looked back since. Good, bad or otherwise on those intros. <laughs> no, I love it. And yeah, no space journey would be complete without some friends. So I'm excited to introduce who we've got on the podcast today. Well, since we've gone down, I've gone down the space theme today. What do you say we double down and jump into the metaverse? I'm very excited about our guest today. That's right. We're coming up in the world and we've not got one, but two guests in the garage today. Our first guest has over 12 years of omni-channel advertising and marketing experience across hundreds of clients and agencies leading a variety of industries. She's well-versed in driving consensus among cross-functional teams to solve complex business challenges, has foundations in shopper marketing, near and dear to my heart, e-com, CPG, strategic planning and research, and has a passion for consumer behavior. She's been with Meta, correct me if I'm wrong here in a minute, over eight years, building digital strategies and platform innovations for their biggest advertisers, and really thrives at the intersection of media, technology, and people to fuel strategies that leverage the entirety of Meta's digital ecosystem to drive business forward. She believes ego is a hindrance, learning is more important than always knowing, and that relationships are absolutely everything. Please welcome to the garage, the retail creative lead for Meta, Kiki Allen. How are you today? Hi, thank you, I'm doing well, how are you? Oh, just always stellar when I'm around great friends. So welcome in. Thank you so much, this is exciting. It is exciting. It's even more exciting because we have two guests and our second guest is a seasoned multidisciplinary executive, retail, operations, tech, product development, strategy, merchandising, with expertise in helping companies accelerate their digital transformation to improve consumer experience. As the head of industry for retail, she helps retailers reimagine the shopping experience both in-store and virtually, drive more efficient operations and increase profitability. She is extremely passionate about DE&I efforts in the workplace and in her community, and while at Facebook, leads a Black women coaching circle to ensure all Black women at the company have equal opportunities to become strong leaders. She's an avid runner and a killer at-home chef, from what I understand. Please welcome Alicia LaBeouf. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you guys so much for having me. Most important question, Alicia, go-to recipe. If you're a killer at home chef, what's the go to recipe? Okay, I'm Southern, so it depends on if I'm making it for me and my husband or for my kids. For my kids, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep it with the butter noodles with some veggies. That's everything. For my husband, so my family is from New Orleans. So, Dumbo is probably my like fall, beginning of winter recipe. Do I bring this out now? And do we talk about our saints soon or later? We can't. We can't get started on Saints Love. We'll save that for the end. How about that? Well, I tell you what, you darn right we're going to save it for the end. We will bring it up. There will be no secondary podcast to talk sports. It happens here. We'll talk about our Saints. All good. That's awesome. Welcome you both to the garage. And Evan, 
All right, I'll let you talk now. Thank you, sir. I was thinking we could save the Saints talk for our Patreon episodes. We could kick up after this. Smash that like and subscribe. <laughs> I like that. The other product idea I had I wanted to run by our meta friends is Cameo for the celebrities that come and talk to you. What about an app you pay to have Dan read your LinkedIn profile? Because when I read, it's like, okay. But when Dan reads it, it's like, wow, I really did something. I feel so much better. I think that's a service we could monetize. I have a great idea. Let's submit that, Kiki. Dan's voice. I like it. Everybody needs a hype man. I did a training exercise for our sales team when they were here in Boise recently and was trying to inspire confidence. How do you go into a room with confidence? And I made them think of their walk-up song. What is it? What's that go-to song that you have in your head as you're walking into a big meeting or a sales pitch or just trying to get up and face the day? And then I actually made a few of them do it. And I brought some friends from our company and they dressed them in boxing attire, had the championship belt. We cranked the music and I made them walk up in front of everybody. At my alma mater, Boise State on the blue turf, it was wild. They had fun and they felt really energized and confident after that. I love that. Oh, I love it. It's fun. But enough about us, enough about me. Can you each share a little bit, a moment or a decision in your career that shaped how you approach the retail media industry? Is there a way to do that? Can you put a pin on something and say, this was a canon event for me that got me thinking a certain way? Yes, I'll start, Kiki. And actually, I'm going to disconnect this from media for a second. So in my background, Dan, you talked about my retail experience. So I used to actually be what they call a DTL, a district team leader for a major retailer. And so I had about 15 stores in the Southeast, and my job was to manage store managers and all of the team leads in that store. And I had that job after being in a corporate job at a retailer for a couple of years. And I would say that job changed me for a couple of reasons. Number one, it got me close to the guests. There's nothing being closer to the guests than when you are managing the guest experience at 10, 15 stores in the Southeast. Number two, it really put in perspective when we talk about media and brands, how that comes to life in the store. And at the time that I was doing this, this is when we were sort of like remodeling back rooms to be able to do in-store fulfillment. Omnichannel was sort of a thing, but it was really ramping up. So it really allowed me to sort of see sort of the closed conversion of discovery and conversion happening in the store in real time. And so that was transformational for me because I felt like this ecosystem is getting faster, is connecting faster, and media is sort of that thing that sort of helps drive discovery and sort of takes it all the way to conversion. And I can see that happening right before my eyes. So every experience that I've had after that has sort of led me to this moment. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Kiki, how about you? I love that, Alicia. Yeah, actually, what's super interesting is when I started off in advertising out of college and creative, the big sexy job was at the brand. Leo Burnett, you wanted to work on the brand, the TV spots at the time. You wanted that Super Bowl spot, land yourself, big brand, tell that linear story, really think about those anthemic spots. But when I started my career, I actually started at Leo Burnett Shopper Marketing Agency, Arc Worldwide. And then you had these people that really understood how consumers tick and how you could drive conversion. And it was seen as less creative. And I was like, I'll start here. I'll start here and then I'll make my way up into that brand building space that all the creatives want to be in. And I started my career at ARC on Procter & Gamble. And I will say in CPG to have that foundation, that 101, the rigor around chopper marketing with a CPG of that size at the beginning of your career, that shaped everything that I've done. Even when I went and did the brand thing later, I came back to retail because I realized you can tell a story all day long and make someone love your brand. But if you can't figure out how to drive that conversion and get them to actually make that purchase, you haven't really completed the full creative consumer journey. And shopper marketing truly, and it could attest like I'm sure any large CPG, but really PNG hammered it in, <laughs> hammered it in me from the beginning. The consumer centricity of the retailer and that understanding of how to intersect the shopper at a specific retailer and a product with a CPG and how those two things come together and that perfect messaging creatively that's going to get someone to to go into that store to buy that product. And the strategy around that and the thoughtfulness that you have to consider was really is what just drives me and it gets me so excited about how creativity can drive conversion at the intersection of retailers and CPGs or vendors. So it's a really, really, at the time, not what I thought was going to shape my career, but has really, to Alicia's point, almost driven every decision I've made since then. 
Great answers. Oh my goodness. As you were talking, Kiki, I couldn't help but think you're talking about connecting customer journeys and the multifaceted things that they experience. A retailer has that, obviously, site, app, the coupon, the rewards programs, the physical in-store experience, which usually has multifaceted things with the coffee shop, the bank, the optical, depending on where you're shopping. And then Meta has done such a good job, more than I think anyone else, in finding those unique touch points with all of the, I don't know if you call them products, but consumer touch points from Reels, Threads, Meta, Insta. I mean, such a wide swath of places where consumers go for inspiration, commerce, social connection. And then marrying that on top with the store side, there's just like infinite ways that we can partner. We've not done infinite partnerships so far, but we've done quite a few. I'd love to talk through like the ones you think are most exciting and then the ones you think RMNs have not leaned into enough yet. That question goes for both of you. So Dan, just to a level set, you're saying some of those partnerships that you think are exciting. So you mentioned, obviously, Facebook and Instagram. We believe that's where discovery happens, right? If you looked at my... Instagram, you would probably see a hundred shares with my husband on either recipes or funny husband memes. That is how we communicate all day, every day. Even before I send him a text message. And so that just shows how things have changed because three to four years ago, that wasn't the case. And for most consumers, especially pre-pandemic, that wasn't the case. And so we've seen this massive move, obviously, to being more connected. And we believe that our apps are the place to do that. And we're making it easy for retailers to do that. And I think with the evolution of retail media networks, they are also continuing to be a place. That's where brands want to be. Brands want to be where people are. People are on our apps. We have over 4 billion people across the planet that are using our apps daily. And so you want to be where people are. You want the eyeballs. You want the conversion. So we believe in that. The one you didn't mention was WhatsApp. So I know we like to talk about our company respective to North America, but we have a huge WhatsApp contingent, especially globally. And what we're seeing there, especially in other countries, is around use cases for conversion and checkout. So think, you know, as WhatsApp populations and interest grows here in the U.S., the ability to shop, to share recipes, to connect with your favorite creator on WhatsApp and have a conversation the same way you would do in a DM through an Instagram. So I think those are things that if I'm thinking like years out are obviously ways that we can partner more. And then you sort of layer on top of all of this. AI, which I know is the big, huge buzzword that everybody wants to use right now. But AI being sort of this space where it's making us more efficient, is making discovery more efficient, is making creativity more efficient. So you will see now if you go in our apps, it'll say, ask Meta or our Meta Mate tools, where if I'm looking for, I don't know, how to make roasted chicken. We've always used AI in our products, but it's gotten much more efficient. So it's bringing creators and recipes to the forefront, again, to sort of match that creativity with commerce, with actual impact. So I think you'll see more of that as we sort of go forward. And again, brands are interested in that. And therefore, I see retail media networks jumping all over those things. That's music to our ears. When you think of, depending on the retail category, the product itself is the point of inspiration. And maybe it's that high-end designer piece of luggage. You don't really need a whole story around that. When it comes to -to day-to-day groceries and commodities, general merchandise products, that inspiration moment is so powerful. When you see it in a recipe being made by somebody that's got a creative flair that aligns to what you're interested in, it just moves from like, oh yeah, I need to pick up some product X on my way home to, oh my God, I'm going to text my husband, Instagram my husband, and make sure we can get these ingredients so we can make that tonight. It's such a more exciting, more sustainable, more shareable point of person's day. And that's what we want to elevate all retail media to. There is a place for price and item-based marketing, but we see the loyalty, the conversion, the stickiness of those inspired moments as the gold star standard. And we need places then to run that media and do it in a way that's scalable and has audiences that overlap with ours. So that's how our friendship here started with Albertson's Media Collective and the Meta family. Yeah. And look, we, having been on the retail side, I know that the audience is your guest is like your most prized possession. We think we are the place for the offsite piece. So yes, you know your guests better, much better than we do. The power of that together to me creates a dynamic relationship for retail media. And I think that's where you'll start to see a lot of the magic happen. And that's where you'll start to say brands say, 
not only I want to leverage the offsite that I'm using with Meta with the properties that Albertson's customer and how do I drive sort of that in store and outside of the store. So I think you're absolutely right. And I think to do it successfully, you have to speak the language of the platform, which short from entertaining content. Like if someone's in that laid back mode, we understand that user's mindset. How are we ensuring that our men's are creating the type of content that's going to connect with that person in that moment? And how are you using more of that inspirational storytelling? And how do you do that at scale for all of your partners, which is really a challenge to do. We talk a lot about creating at the speed of culture. How do you produce at the speed of culture? How do you help supplement your partners with the right content that tells the right story on our platform at the right time so that you can really hook them into those inspiring moments, whether that's with the creator creating a recipe or whether that's coming directly from the co-branding? Yeah, co-branding. Let's talk about that one a little bit. And then I just wanted to address another topic. It comes up at conferences way more than I think it should. But this idea of retail media networks expanding off platform and people will make that statement as though it's new. Maybe I'm just old school, but I've been doing retail media for almost 10 years, Roundell to kick it off and Albertson's the last three. Off platform has been a huge part of our strategy for most of that time. And while onsite is fantastic, it has the most connectivity to the actual shopper in the moment of shopping. There's limited scale. And then we need to find those folks in those more inspiring moments in the rest of their lives. And so off-platform is a top growth strategy for any RMN and, and has been for a long time, but wanted to make that statement out there for anyone that was thinking otherwise. So anyone looking to get into RMNs or recently in RMNs, those off-platform partnerships are going to be key to growth on day one. You know, Evan, when somebody say they've been working in something for 10 years, you know what we call that, right? Experienced. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to put labels, no labels on there. Yeah. All right. Well, so for both of you, you've been around in different roles in retail media, in digital. What are the biggest trends you're seeing in grocery specific retail media and how should grocery retailers be preparing for those as you see them coming down? Hey, Kiki, it's your turn to start. It'd be the harder one for me because live and breathe just grocery across all, all retail. But I will say in talking to Albertsons and even the conversations that we had at Can together, I do see, I mean, the trend we all need to move toward is the ability to storytell on our platform and put consumers at the centers of those stories. And I think that's why we brought bundle ads, why we've talked about creators so much, why we think about how do we make sure that these RMNs aren't just seen as that product on white, that lowest part of the funnel, the very uninspired, very conversion-based, very transactional, when there's such an opportunity to tell that the duality of the stories that you have together with your partners. So I see in grocery right now, definitely a deficit in sort of that storytelling. I see a lot of very single ad campaigns that are very static in nature, very uninspired, very product forward, not very creative in terms of that emotional hook or motivator just extremely functional. So for me, I guess the trend that I'm seeing is that there's a lot of opportunity creatively in this space compared to maybe some other RMN outside of grocery. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, hearkening back to those warmer days in Cannes, we mentioned the, the bundled ads opportunity. And it's such a brilliant way to bring a larger story to life without going all the way into a social influencer video, which I think is a great piece of the puzzle. But on that journey to the video lives this opportunity to tell stories with items at a price. Maybe it's the weekly ad content put into a bundled ad that tells a story around the most affordable recipe at Albertsons today. So we're excited to be partnering with you on that ad unit. But more importantly, and I should have added this to my last statement about moving off platform, the one downside of moving off platform isn't so much the creative, oftentimes partners have even better creative options and opportunities. It's proving the performance. Well, we do want to inspire. We want to connect at all the great places at the right price. How do we prove back to our CPGs that this is a good idea, a good investment, and do it in a way that is a little better than surveys and panels and some of the softer modeled measurement that the industry has been plagued with? We need to prove transactional stat sig conversions. Maybe talk us through how Meta thinks about that. This is a great segue. Because I was going to give you three things. And Evan, just to kind of double on your point about what brands want. I think the first thing, obviously, is closed loop measurement. That if I had a dollar for every time I closed loop measurement, I would probably be on the beach right now. And I think it goes back to that. 
If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Period. Full stop. So we know that's what brands want. And we know that ROAS is a starting point, but ultimately brands want incrementality. And so we are aware of that. We're working on that. But all roads lead to measurement and your ability to go back to these brands and say, here's the value that Meta coupled with Albertsons provides. At Meta, we have a few products that do that. They do product level reporting, et cetera. What we know where the industry is moving towards is around incrementality. So I would say that's number one. And I think you hit on that with the measurement piece. Second is around self-serve is a priority for our men's. So right now it is still very complicated and confusing. You got on-site, you got off-site. You're dealing with multiple platforms, not just meta. So if you're new to this space or even I would say advanced in this space, the campaign management tools of how to do this are still either you build it or you buy it and it's still very complicated. So I'm seeing that trend. I think what you're starting to see is a little bit more of the advanced RMN sort of have their own self-service priorities. They're sort of deciding where they want to invest their tech stack to be able to support brands. But that's a big area that obviously we care about and we are working on products that are able to help RMN scale in that way because they we know that they're thinking about scale and all roads lead back to the ability to do that through a self-service model. And then last but not least, I would say transparency. So greater transparency breeds trust. It fosters growth, all those things. Brands want to know with confidence and accuracy how their dollars are performing. So they know the performance they get on Meta. They want to know what that means when they take Meta and bundle it with Albertsons. And so I know the IEB is moving towards transparency. We are thinking about and looking at products and ecosystems that really support this element of transparency. But I think that's a trend that we're going to continue to see, especially as the large CPGs sort of demand it. I think the early days was our men's were in hyper growth mode. What we're seeing right now, they still are growing, but the CPGs are like, okay, enough is enough. We will hear certain things we want. And I think transparency is going to be one of those. So then bringing it back to in talking about grocery, because it's all about grocery on this podcast. One of the old traditions that still lingers is the circular. Yes, we've jumped into the 21st century with digital circulars. And I wanted to know, how is Meta improving digital circulars? And what potential is there for linking these with other Meta tools like product catalogs? Dang, you'd be surprised. Like digital circular, as much as it makes sense for me, I'm like, God, please do not hand me a circular when I go in the grocery store. <laughs> Some people still kind of like a Kindle versus a book. Some people still want a digital circular. But look, we've seen tremendous growth in our digital circular product. We've enabled digital circular to buy across our traffic objective, which we've heard from partners is one of the key objectives. We now have digital circular compatible with Instagram reels and feeds. So I know we've talked about, we highlighted reels a little bit. So this just means that it can display across our apps and our services to give more people the opportunity to discover. You're looking at your reel and you're kind of seeing the circular within that reel. And we know that based on some of the analysis that we've done right now, on average, digital circular is driving 6.5 times omni-channel IRO as. So when it's done and done right, we know that it works. And we're going to continue to innovate that product based on feedback we're getting from partners. But to me, that's what they call an easy layup and an easy way to Kiki's point to like sort of bring in creators as sort of that inspiration. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting space creatively. And we've worked on the digital circular product. Is beginning, Abby and my team has been instrumental in that. We actually looking at two other meta products and how we can intersect sort of that same opportunity. One is Messenger. So we talked about WhatsApp. We'll talk about Messenger a little bit. But one of the capabilities of Messenger is for users to actually opt in to reoccurring notifications, which is great for this product. Because if you do enter into a Messenger thread to get that first circular touch point, you can actually signal that you're interested in getting sort of hit back with a free message is that no fee to the advertiser from messenger when there's something new to share so maybe a new discount the next week maybe you want them weekly because you're getting the weekly circular whatever that cadence is that makes sense for the retailer you can actually re-notify the user we're also thinking of reminder ads for the same reason it's an ad product that we have we actually set a reminder for when the new prices are going to come out the new circular is going to drop just to ensure that we're always keeping customers notified sort of when these discounts are going to be coming through at their favorite retailers, they don't miss out. So I think those two products and future evolutions of products are going to allow for user opt-in for notifications are really, really nice fit 
for Digital Circular. I love that because I think one of the areas that we really pride ourselves on is the personalized relationship we have with our customer and being able to have that conversation with them in a meaningful way is something that's going to take not just our business far, but our partners in CPG land far as well. 100%. And once you open up a messenger thread, that's that one-to-one conversation. You can add a personality to it. You can have a conversation. You can add so much more than just those discounts or, or what the circular offers today. Yeah. A little subscription model versus the mailbox. I love that. Uh, listeners that were with us on our cargo episode where we had Harry Gregman talking about how he was enabling somewhat complicated multi-item ad units that the places where we marketed those was on Meta. So we've had a pretty deep relationship with what you would call the circular coming from a decline in print. So I think people are shrinking their print investment for a couple of different reasons, eco and cost effectiveness. And the great alternative is a digital solution, better for the environment and a better reflection of where people are spending their time, where they want to get inspiration for grocery. But I wasn't aware of the subscription side. We'll have to take a peek at that. Yes. And that's exciting. That's awesome. Hey, just for our listeners, you touched a little bit on bundle ads. Can you explain a little bit how bundle ads work and what results they're driving for advertisers on Meta's platforms? Yeah, well, we're still in alpha, so we don't have a lot of results to share, really any at all. Yeah, but testing is fun, right? Right. We're just learning still how the product actually operates. I mean, alphas are really interesting. If you haven't been part of what, definitely recommend leaning in. You guys have. Thank you so much for being part of this one. But really, it works on the back end of our catalog ad solution, which is our most dynamic and efficient and effective ad product that we have. And so you don't actually have to sacrifice signal and efficiency to build in the capability of storytelling, as Alicia said, which is really exciting about this product. So what it does is actually allows you to upload a piece of what we call hero creative to the catalog. And what we're doing with Albert Sins is recipe focused, makes a ton of sense for grocery. It actually allows you to tell a recipe story and then link your catalog products that are relevant to that recipe And that allows our system to optimize based on its signal and based on your incredible signal and actually decide what to show a user, whether it's the recipe creative followed by the suite of products or one of the single products, whatever we think from our system is going to help them convert. But it allows you, if that single product isn't converting you, to actually bring forward a bigger story about the relationship between those products and then hopefully increase basket size via that inspiration. So it's a really cool product. A very modern and progressive approach to how not just retail media and a major social, multiple social platforms work together, but really commerce in general. The value of when the click happens and where the sale happens is becoming less obvious. It's more like, let's just get the sale. Let's get the engagement. If that can happen more seamlessly in a very high powered ad that has all our ad units or uh, products in it already. That to me is a more progressive approach to shoppable ads in general than some of the other solutions we've seen out there. And I think from a consumer's perspective, clicking out of an experience and going to another website can be important if it's a significant shopping engagement, but doing it inside the activity they're already doing is such a way to honor their time and relationship with the retailer. And then the funny thing is, I know my friends in pure e-com businesses may not agree with that statement. Through proper data connections and partnerships with folks like yourself, we can track every one of those SKU sales at a store level, at a guest level. And so whether the conversion happens in that ad and and the shopper can continue being inspired or they do decide to leave and come to our site, most of the time they're converting in store anyway. So everybody's happy. Exactly. And because we're social, you always have that save capability. I see a recipe, I save it, I go shop later. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Some repeat action. (laughs) I have to do that a lot because I'll plan something for dinner and then my kids look at the menu and say, nope. So, all right, we'll hold that for next week. That's good. (laughs) (laughs) If you would, what products or ad placements do you think retail media networks aren't using enough? What could we plus up on and how can we benefit from these? Reels. I think this is such an opportunity. And I know it's challenging to introduce any new placement that requires new creative. And Reel specifically does require sort of an ability to speak the language of that placement to get the delivery you want, to get the performance that you want and delivery that you want in that space. And that's why we often talk about Reels and creators hand in hand, because they can be a production arm for you and actually help supplement that creative process and sort of shortcut you 
to the language of the platform. And so we talk about them as creators instead of influencers for that reason, because we do think about them as producers for brands. But at the same time, that partnership is key that you're not just using them as a producer. You're actually using their creative foil, their expertise, their relationship with your brand, with the brands that you're serving to help tell a holistic story. So I would say absolutely get onto Reels. And if you need help, call Creative Shop at Meta. We'll help you. And I love that. Who better to tailor the creative for that bespoke audience of the influencer slash creator than the creator themselves? It's going to be very difficult for a company of any size to generate the amount of versions necessary to speak to each of those creators' universes. And then to do it in an authentic tone seems next to impossible. So I love that. I don't know what you would call that integrated creative solution on top of the creator experience. That's fantastic. Alicia, how does Meta ensure that new advertising tools are useful for both the big and small retail media networks? I know we're not all created the same. We try to play when we talk about standardization, but how do we go about doing that? Or how does Meta go about doing that? So I would actually say it's a journey. Like our goal is to build for everybody. And as ambitious as that is, you also know that the rubber hits the road. And as we're building, we also have to segment because large RMNs may not need the same thing as really small RMNs. Really small RMNs don't need the same thing as large RMNs. So our goal is to build for the ecosystem and then tweak, edit, iterate based on what we're hearing from the market from some of our closest partners. And the Albertsons would be example. And we're early days. I will not say our product suite today is fully robust and fully capable of all the things that need to happen for people to scale, for them to get close with measurement. We're headed there, but we want to get the basics right. What we found in early days is our men's were just using our platform the same way their retail friends were using it. They're using ads manager. They're running ads. And as they got more sophisticated, we realized, no, they need things around self-service. They need things around measurement. They need simple things like being able to report out performance to the brands that they're working with. <laughs> and so I think there's some fundamental things that everybody needs. So like catalogs are crucial, especially for great schools, period. We have an infrastructure to support store-based local inventory. So this is inclusive of like dynamic pricing and availability. This empowers hyper-local ads. So you want that as a grocer. I want to see at Albertsons what's in my local store. And I don't want you to send me that ad if the salary is not available that week, for example, in my local store. And so what we're really preaching now is we're really trying to clean up the hygiene. Here's how you use our tools, the ones that we currently have. And then I think what you'll see is we'll build off of that. And then we have great partnerships like the one we have with Albertsons around what should we be building towards? How do you want to use this information? Does our product work the way it should? And so I think what you will see in the future is sort of this more bundled go-to-market approach where we will say, look, we want to support the RM and ecosystem. What are your needs? And then how can we scale to grow with you? And at the same time, there will be a lot of automation, especially for the smaller ones that just want to have reporting. They want to be able to show an ad and that's it. I think our platform is actually really good at that. We do that with a lot of our small and mid-sized businesses already. So I think the big opportunity is with the large ones. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do there. But I think when it comes to sort of the smaller and mid-sized RMNs, I think we've done a really good job of saying, here's some products you're already using. Here's how you can sort of automate and scale that. So I think that's what you can expect. Fantastic. I think the other thing we're excited about, I will confirm the partnership side, we've seen a wholesale shift in general from major media platforms to supporting RMNs. And I think that's just standard business, follow the money. But Meta's done it in a way that's a little more meaningful and a little more designed for what retailers are struggling with, product catalogs being kind of the core foundation. And without that ingestion of some pretty unfun, unsexy data, you can't jump to the next level, which is a recipe that's relevant for that zip code, for that banner, which is really what the shopper's going to need if they're going to go purchase the product. So we really appreciate that lean in on the partnership side. And the other thing is we're well past the era of a platform building a technology and just the world adopting to it. Now we have to make agencies happy. We have to keep our CPGs happy. There's no way to do that without collaboration and communication and co-designing these things, even with the CPGs at the table too. And so that requires a little bit of a humble roll of the sleeves attitude, something that historically large organizations have struggled to do, but kudos to Meta for leaning in. I think your two roles in particular, but the whole RMN team that we work with moves with that mantra 
And that's exactly how we move. And I think that's how we're going to bake RMN shine for our clients for a long time coming. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that, Evan. I will say it's definitely been a journey for us, for sure. Historically, we have not done bespoke where we're like, we're going to build this solution for this client. And I think just given the birth and the robust growth of RMNs, the segmentation is starting to naturally happen where you sort of have the large ones, the mid-sized ones, and the small ones. What so allows us from an engineering standpoint to say, all right, what do we need to build? How will they use these tools? Is there anything that we need to tweak? But I think in terms of like 90% of the RMNs all want the same thing. It's that 10% of what will we edit, tweak, get feedback on that we can help RMNs continue to scale and grow is sort of the opportunity that we want to focus on. So what do you see as the next opportunities for retail media networks? And how is Meta, how can Meta and retailers work together to address those? Yeah, so going back to what I said earlier, measurement. <laughs> Close with measurement. Claire Wyatt on our team would say measurement is hot. Yeah, Claire would say measurement. Again, self-serve. We have a phenomenal partnership with you all, but it's still not easy. I think ease of use would probably be the tagline. And we are working to make it easy. It should not be complicated. And in many ways, the way that we work with like you all in the RMN is very different from the way we work from the marketing enterprise team that's just running ads for Albertsons. And so we need to adapt and sort of continue to learn what are the use cases? How are you learning? And I think we also have a really good opportunity to bring together the retailers and the CPG partners to sort of have this conversation together. It's almost like this tri relationship. You have us, the Theater, you have the retailer as an Albertsons, and then you have the CPG. We all are using each other and we all need each other. And in some ways, we all kind of have the same goals. And so how do we sort of work together to really define what that future could look like and be? And so I think you'll continue to see iteration. We launch products all the time. I think what my team tries to do is work really closely with our engineers to say, does this work for a retail media network? Should it work for a retail media network? Are there blockers here? What would they say? And we have really great partnerships with our partners or we will go to them and say, what do you think about this? Does it work? And so I think that allows us to learn, to pivot. They say feedback is a gift. We want it to keep coming and we don't always get it right. But I think this posture of we want to learn, we want to grow, we want to facilitate sort of the growth and sort of be your offsite partner. You'll continue to see that as we go forward. From a creative standpoint, I know creative isn't always the number one topic when you're thinking RMN. There's so many other things that we discussed today that are super important and really should be priority. I think the creative team, just like Alicia, like we're, my team is the RMN advocate for creative. So even when we're talking to product and how we're building out our generative creative tools for first party with an ads manager, we're always thinking the same thing. Like, okay, how would this work for an RMN? We're looking at introducing brand safety into those Gen AI tools. Well, what happens when there's two brands? How are we thinking about that and making sure you can put two brand toolkits when you're generating this creative? So just making sure that voice of RMN is heard in the larger product roadmap and helping to influence and shape it. And then when those products are directly applicable, how do we find partners like an Albertsons to say, hey, text generation, we think this could actually work to help diversify content for your partners when you're running these campaigns. Do you want to test that together with us? Or background generation for catalog. There are things that we can start doing together to test general market products with RMNs and then potentially make a case to evolve them for the needs. Test and learn. Yeah, that's the only way forward. Got me through high school. Guess, check, refine. That got me through high school. So this question then is for both of you. If you had to give one piece of advice to brands and retailers to get the most out of their partnership with Meta, what would it be? I would say a couple of things. Number one, I think we have been in the advertising business for a long time. <laughs> And we believe we're good at it. And I think if you go back to the genesis of Facebook, it was really this idea that we wanted to provide advertising tools to small businesses the same way large businesses have them. And sort of that empowerment of being able to say, business, you can reach your audiences through our platform. We take very serious. And so a lot of the retail media networks are beginner advertising companies. They are less than five years old. They're learning. And there is a lot to learn, especially when you start thinking, I mean, obviously groceries one space, you start getting into other areas that are highly regulated, pharmacy, alcohol, brand safety, like all these things. A lot of it can be trial and error. So I guess my big advice would be use this as a partner, test and learn. Evan said that earlier. We have a few alpha partners. 
And trust me, everybody says, I want to test. I want to be an alpha partner. No, you don't. Because an alpha partner means that things are going to break. An alpha partner means that we're not always going to get it right. And an alpha partner means that we may get to the end of the road and say, this is not working for either of us. So we're going to deprecate it and move on. And that sentiment is easier said than done. Because a lot of times when you're in sort of the corporate beast, when something is prioritized, you want to focus on it. And it takes a lot for you to back off of it once you've been doing it for six months. We're used to, have you met the hurdle? Yes, let's go. Have you not met the hurdle? We're moving on. So I think sort of this test and learn mentality is a key to that. The last one I would just say is just around feedback. Again, this is a new ecosystem that I think we know it's changed the way advertising works. We know that the first party audiences that most of our clients have are very valuable for them. And so we want to be additive. We want to be incremental to how you think about growing your business. And so I would just say feedback. Sometimes feedback isn't always great. It's a gift though, because I think that helps us be better. And I think also just sort of gleaning off each other and learning together. So that's what I would say. Great answer. Awesome. Kiki, how about you? Alicia pretty much said it all. I think The only thing I've started to notice in the industry as a whole in terms of just modern marketing and what we need to do to be successful moving forward as marketers is that you have to feel comfortable letting go of some control. And I think that the brands that are willing to do that and say, I'll go into that alpha, I'm okay a little with Gen AI kind of tweaking like the tight constraints of a brand toolkit for performance gains. I'm okay not being the sole owner of this decision and I'm going to bring in other partners who are advisors to me and who I trust to help guide us. I think this idea of letting go control a little bit, almost all aspects, even your org structure, and thinking about how you think differently to evolve and be flexible, that would be the advice that I give. And I would say, like, I met us here to help you in that because, to Alicia's point, we go through that in our day-to-day work across a lot of businesses. We've seen it from a lot of different sides, and we can help be just a trusted friend and advisor as you're going through that with your organizations, too. But just be okay with change and letting go a little bit of the script, especially as we move into this world of Gen AI. Wow. I mean, the two of the best answers we've had so far on the podcast. Agree. Perfectly aligned to how we think about things. Like if you're not going to lean in and be part of the agents of change that are out there on the front lines, they're not always going to be successful to some of the points here. It's going to fail. It's going to hurt. It's going to be extra work. But if you're not there, then you're subjected to whatever that front line builds. And then you're a recipient and a follower and not really representing what's best for your CPGs. We want to be on every alpha because while it's painful and we will lose a couple of them, the ones we win, we can help shape them in ways that are mutually beneficial for CPGs, us, and Meta. And ultimately, if it's not beneficial for you, it's not going to operate. And so this concept of us versus them or I win when you lose is such an antiquated way of thinking about things, as is waiting for the masses to produce an off-the-shelf product for your retail media network. That's not going to service your unique needs or progress the things that you're good at in the industry. Partner, accept the pain that it's going to bring, hold hands, find folks who have the same mentality, same personality types, and wade through the difficult times together. I love it. I would ask you guys that same question. What can we do better to support our men's? I like it. We've been put on the spot, Evan. I told you, they're coming after our jobs. Yeah, I mean, Evan, you go first. (laughs) I think the connective tissue across the different entities that Meta has acquired, I mean, a massive portfolio of of assets that I think anybody would be jealous of. Seamlessly integrating all of those can be a challenge on our operations side, creative side. Not too different from how all of our banners create challenges too. We have 12 banners that we need to operate within your platform that can be difficult. And so putting those two things together creates a lot of permutations of work and management. And if I think about self-serve within our handles, 12 different banners across all your different platforms, that's a lot of work and a lot of management. And so figuring out ways to seamlessly enable multi-banner retailers, I think would be number one. And number two, I love the self-serve investment. I think OpenWeb has gotten a big head start compared to social and some of the other media opportunities. But people are hungry. People want that self-serve at the large scale level. I'm thinking agencies and progressive CPGs. And with the advancements in Cleanroom, I think we can crush some self-serve stuff together. So excited to hear you bring that up. For me, I think it's continue to bring the excitement around what we used to do in shopper marketing land. It's all about cases on the floor. 
how do we sell more stuff faster and measure the unit volume, measure the category growth, measure the fact that we're still a grocery store, all the digital and all the media is awesome, but what does it do for my customer? How do I sell more stuff faster? I think if you continue to bring that passion and that energy, that is what's really going to get us across the line and grow that incremental basket size and continue to build our business together. Great. Perfect. You guys, this has been awesome. I mean, if I go back to put my teacher hat on, I always got to review the learning targets at the end of the lesson. I said at the beginning of this program, we're trying to make the retail media industry better than how we found it. I feel like after this 45 minute conversation, if you don't feel that way, you're in the wrong area because I sure feel like it is. Evan, you? 100% agree. boy. There we go. Well, listen, we couldn't thank you both enough for being guests in the garage. So Alicia LaBeouf, Kiki Allen, both from Meta, thank you so much for being here with us and inspiring our knowledge and, and helping us learn together and being just great partners with us on this journey. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, guys. This is fun. Hold on a second. But I digress. Alicia. How many games are the Saints going to win this year? <laughs> hey, so in caveat, I am from North Carolina. No, no, no. But where do you live? I live in Chicago. Uh, uh, okay. We got a new squad here. How's that working out? Pretty good? Well, that's been a couple months. Yeah, me too about my Saints. <laughs> I know, but I am a true Carolina Panthers fan because I grew up in Charlotte. So my dad's Carolina Panthers. All day, which is also not a great story. Well, I mean, it is. You've got my leftover quarterback. Who is going to be on the pot? Because my Carolina Panthers fans are going to be like, what? That's all right. If we've got a Carolina Panthers fan on with a New Orleans Saint diehard, we can get along in the South as long as we both hate the Atlanta Falcons. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> no love for the Falcons. At all, ever. It was 18 years ago yesterday that Team Gleason blocked the punt in our first game back to the Superdome after Katrina. So we're still celebrating that. Still posting pictures of that. I think you need a sports podcast. I can do that. I mean, which ring do you want me to put on? Do you want me to put on the Saints championship ring? I do have the Boise State championship ring. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I may have the fantasy football championship ring. It's all here, whatever you want. But we'll go back to the garage. Thank you so much for being here. For our listeners out there, if you like what you hear, if you don't like what you hear, we'd still like you to subscribe. Hit that like button. We'll be back with more episodes of The Garage. Thank you for joining us on this little journey. For Evan Navorka, our friends Alicia and Kiki, this has been yet another episode of The Garage. <laughs>